time and miss miss church for it. You know, she told me she was going to go to the uh, Vietnamese Victory Church somewhere here in Toronto. I think it's in North York, maybe or Scarborough. I'm not sure where. Haven't met them yet, but uh, looking forward to meet them um, next month. Actually, we have a pastor's gathering. Um, but some of you might not know that Pastor Mercia is like one thirty second, thirty two. Vietnamese. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, I chose a really, you know, far number because chances are she might be, right? I don't know. <laughs> no, but she told me that she was going to do that. And I said, oh, that's pretty cool. I didn't know. What I, didn't, what I really didn't know was I didn't know that the Vietnamese celebrated a Lunar New Year. I thought it was only the Chinese that did that, right? And you see a lot of those... Um, Phrases, I can't even say it properly, the Chinese phrase, Kung Hao Fat Choi or something like that. Whenever they say that, I think they're calling me fatso. You know, they look at me, Kung Hao Fat Choi, you're a fatso. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, and uh, that's amazing how, how, how people have those different celebrations. In fact, the Eastern Orthodox Church celebrates Easter on a different day too, right, as well. So that's, that's pretty cool. So welcome to um, Missoga Victory Church. If we haven't met yet, my name is Pastor Mark. For those of you who are online watching this and we haven't met, my name is Pastor Mark. And I'm glad that everyone is here today, even those of you who are online. If you've ever had a feeling that there's something missing in your life and that you were meant for so much more, if you're new to church, to Jesus and the Bible, and you still have a lot of unanswered questions, or if you've been disconnected from the faith for a while and you're trying to make your way back, I'm glad to say that you, you belong here. This is for people, this church is for people like that. If you're, you're in one of those categories, you're in the right place. Uh, we wanna help you, and I really wanna help you better understand what it means to be fully alive. How many of you know that the glory of God is man fully alive? St. Irenaeus said that, and I totally believe that. I totally believe that statement, that we glorify God when we are most alive in Him. And um, we want to help you discover what that means. I want you to be excited about getting up in the morning and facing the challenges that you face every day, because I want to help you see how even the obstacles and challenges in your life, not, they don't only happen to you, but they happen for you. God is in control. And I want to greet those who are joining us through live stream or on the YouTube channel. Uh, we know that uh, quite a number of people, what they'll do is they'll look uh, at the service first on, online before showing up through these doors at all. So we look forward to having you here. And if, if you used to come here, you're watching right now, you used to come here, come back. Come back for Easter especially. Okay, that's in about six weeks. So I'm giving you lots of lead time, lots of time to put your makeup and to choose the dress you're going to wear and everything like that. Six weeks, come on. But we would love to make Easter like a big family reunion and see everybody who used to be here come back and enjoy and have, have, uh, have some, uh, not only fellowship, but, but you know, some celebration in the presence of the Lord. So will you please take your Bible in your hand, or if you're using an app on your phone, take your cell phone, open up the Bible app. And uh, if you wanted to, and you're, you're using your phone, you're going to open it to your Bible app. You can open it to Galatians chapter 3. That's what we're going to take a look at today. I want you to take your Bible in your hand or your cell phone or tablet in your hand, whatever you have your Bible in, and raise it up and say this after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. And I am becoming what it says I will become. Today, I receive the seed of the word of God. It will bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold in my life. My mind is alert, my heart is receptive, my spirit is ready, the truth will set me free. I will never be the same again. 
in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Do you believe that? Turn to the person on your left and say, do you believe that? <laughs> Amen. You know, in the 90s and the early 2000s, if you still remember those, that's what, 20 years ago or so, everyone who owned a cell phone either possessed or wanted to buy a phone by Nokia. Do you remember that? Do you remember those phones? My second cell phone that I ever owned, and uh, I didn't even buy it. It was actually given to me as a birthday present. My second cell phone that I ever owned was a dark blue Nokia 1100. You remember those? B dark blue, okay, white trim, silver buttons, and they were smooth as a baby's bottom. You remember those oval keypad? And it was like, oh, so smooth. Nokia cell phones were, by 2013, Nokia cell phones were obsolete, and they looked to get out of the industry altogether. You know that Nokia wanted to get out of the cell phone industry at some point in the early in 2013. What happened? Well, according to Slash Gear, and I'm quoting them, there were a variety of reasons that Nokia started to fall out of favor with consumers, but perhaps the biggest reason had to do with the phones themselves. While the company did dominate the mobile phone industry for over a decade, it did not dominate the smartphone industry, which was just emerging at the time with stiff competition from companies like Motorola, Samsung, and Huawei. Consumers were willing to pay for a slightly more expensive device with a good user experience and app support. Nokia phones ran on Symbian OS. I never remember Symbian Gosh, it would, it would pop up there, the word Symbian, when you turned on your phone, your Nokia phone. Um, Nokia phones ran on Symbian OS, which seemed inadequate and obsolete to iPhone and Android users. And in a leaked internal memo from 2011, Nokia's then CEO, Stephen Elop, lamented that the company did not, quote, did not have a product that was close to their experience when speaking directly about the end, the iPhone, end quote. When I switched to a smartphone, my first phone was an iPhone. Then I, I had that for a few years, and then I, I flirted a little bit with a Google phone. It was just a flirtation. It wasn't a commitment, right? It was a side thing. Uh, but then I repented and came back to my current iPhone 15 Pro Max. But you know what? I miss my Nokia. I miss my Nokia. Even when I was shopping around for this phone, I missed it. I missed the feel of that hard plastic, small plastic in my hand. I didn't have to hold it like this. I could hold it like this. Remember that? Now I got these wide screens because you're watching movies on your phone. I remember feeling the, the buttons, the texture of those silver buttons. And here's the, the, the excellent part of it. I miss being able to text people without looking at my phone. I don't know if you were able to do that. But people, my friends here in North America, when I would come back to visit for a few months, while I was living in the Philippines, I'd come back and I've had, I've had this Nokia 1100. And, you know, I would, I, would, I would coordinate some stuff and I would be texting, one-handed, one thumb. And they'd look at me and they'd go, holy cow, look at your fingers go. How do you do that? What do you mean, how do I do that? This is, this is the way we do it. The Philippines is the text cap, was at that time the text capital of the world. There were more text messages being exchanged in the Philippines than anywhere else in the world. We were like that. We loved our cell phones. A study showed that cell phones were the great equalizer among, among youth between the ages of 16 and 24. McCann Erickson put out that kind. We had a friend at McCann Erickson Advertising Company. They put out a study that way, and they showed that the kind of cell phone that you owned as a, as a young person determined your status in that group, Right? And 
But I missed being able to do that. In fact, my brothers questioned, you know, oh, you can't do that. You're not faster than me. And we sat in a Tim Hortons in Ottawa, in Orleans. We sat there and said, okay, I have, th- I have two brothers. The three of us were having coffee. I said to my youngest brother, you tell us, you dictate to us what you want us to type. My other brother is going to type. I'm going to type the same message. Let's see who finishes first. And, you know, so my brother was dictating. And here I go. Done. No way. How can you be done already? I was like, dude, give me your other phone. Say it again. Both thumbs at the same time, two different phones. Yeah. I was like, and they call these smartphones? You know? I love that. I miss doing, being able to do stuff like that. I miss being able to, you know, to text without having to look, miss the texture, et cetera, et cetera, like I mentioned. Now, making the transition from the law to the gospel can be just as difficult, if not more difficult, from moving from a Nokia phone with the plastic keyboard to a, to a touch screen. Very difficult, very difficult. From Symbian to iOS or Android. That transition going from living your life according to the law to living your life according to faith in the gospel, that is difficult for a lot of people. And that was, it was difficult, especially for Jewish believers. These were Christians. These were people who believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. But they had a really hard time transitioning out of the law. This is what we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks in the book of Galatians. This is the main issue in the book of Galatians, in the letter to the Galatians. The transition, because... These, what we, what's called in the Bible, Judaizers, these people were telling the new Gentile Christians that didn't have the law and that didn't have synagogues and didn't have those kinds of priests. They were saying, you have to convert. If you want to be a real Christian, you got to realize that Jesus was a Jew and you better convert to Judaism as well as Christianity. You have to add on top of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to follow the law that Moses gave to the Jewish people. This is a revelation from God. This is from the Lord. And that was a big issue in the early years of the first church, especially in Jerusalem. So much so that in the middle of the book of Acts, the apostles called for a conference And they conferred with one another regarding this issue about Gentile believers having or being obligated to obey the law, the regulations that are found in the law. And you know what their final say was? You know what their final decision was? They sent a letter out to the churches, to the ecclesia that gathered, that were predominantly Gentile. They sent Paul and Barnabas and other apostles, they sent them out as emissaries to give this letter, to read this letter to those Gentile Christians saying, we do not want to make it hard for you. We decided, and with the Holy Spirit's guidance, we decided we shouldn't make it hard for Gentiles to follow you. We couldn't even follow the law. How much more should we expect Gentiles who've never had the law to try to obey it. We're putting on a yoke upon them that we ourselves could not bear. And so James, the brother of Jesus, one of the pillars of the the early church, he said, we are not going to obligate Gentiles, non-Jewish people, to obey the old covenant, the old, the regulations, the rituals, the laws, the civil rules, all of that. The only thing we're going to ask them to do is we're going to ask them to do not eat animals that were strangled, do not eat blood, right? Do not, you know, do not, um, fo- you know, don't be idolatrous, and avoid sexual immorality. That's all. That's that's the only thing we want them to. Do. And that's not because of a commandment. That's that we. This is because, and the reason why they gave was this: because in every town in the Roman Empire. 
Moses is preached. In other words, Moses' standard is preached. And if you want to, if we want to reach the Jews first with the gospel, you can't offend them right away. Right? You can't offend them right away by you know coming in, coming into a singular going, eating pork rinds, right? And some pork chop. You can't do that walking in that way because they're not even going to listen to you. They're not going to give you a chance. So let's, let's remove the barriers that are preventing the gospel from connecting to the people we want to reach. That's, that's all we're going to do. And that's the reason why we're going to do it. Paul takes great pains. He takes six chapters in this letter to explain to the Galatian Christians this whole decision and why it's so important that we understand that as believers in the Messiah, we are no longer obligated and bound to the law. We're actually set free. And that's the reason why this series, we titled it Breaking Free. Because you and I, as Christians, we need to know that we've been set free. Not only have we been set free from our addictions and set free from our sins and our guilt and shame, but we've also been set free from the requirements of the law. We've been set free from religion. I posted this on my, on my Facebook page. I said, the gospel does not call you to change religion. The gospel calls you to abandon religion altogether. The gospel doesn't call you to go from being Catholic to being a Protestant. Doesn't call you to from being a Jehovah's Witness to being a Pentecostal. Doesn't call you from being a Baptist to being Presbyterian. Doesn't call you to change religions. The gospel calls each and every one of us, calls each and every one of us to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. The last time I checked, Jesus did not have a favorite denomination. Last time I checked, there was only one church in the world with Jesus Christ as the head. But people have trouble transitioning from the law to the gospel because they miss the clarity of expectation. This is what the law does. Rules give us clarity of expectation. What do you, have, what do you require of me? Give me some guidelines. We like rules. And, and you know, rules are appropriate. Rules and norms are appropriate in corporations, in businesses, they're even appropriate in, in family gatherings to some degree. There are some things you just don't, ever, you know, for example, imagine fathers here. Imagine if you heard one of your children, one of your, if you heard this and witnessed this, one of your children calling your wife, their mother, a witch, not the one with the W either. What would you do? I'll tell you what, not in my house. I brought you into this world. I'll take you out. Don't you ever talk to your mother like that. You know, I, I can't, if I get rid of you, I can just make another one of you with her. Right? It's like, so there's, there, there's, there's a place for rules and norms, but not in our relationship to God. Not in our relationship to God. I would even say rules and norms are appropriate even for a ministry, but not as it applies to our relationship to God. For example, Pastor Marcia has been for the past week or so acquainting me with a lot of rules. And they're not really rules, they're protocol. Like how do, when everybody's gone from the church on a Sunday, how do I shut the church down? How do I turn off the lights and turn on, you know, turn, put, the, put the thermostat on, on, on automatic? How do I... You know, activate the code, you know, the alarm code in the front. How do I lock the door? How do I, you know, how do I open that supply room door? Whoever put the code on there, it's so hard to remember the code. Then you know what I was doing? Here's, here's what I'm doing. This is why I need guidance because I, the first time I opened that up, success. I opened it. Yeah, I remember the code. All right, I got in. When I tried to close it, I punched the code in again because normally you think you punch the code in again so that it locks. Punch the code in, it goes, zzz, zzz, zzz doesn't lock. Try it again. I must have done that a dozen times. Then I finally, I don't remember if I called Wayne or if I called Pastor Marcia, said, how do, you, how do you lock this door? Oh, just press the little icon 
That says lock. Duh! There's no instructions. So sometimes they're helpful, but not in our relationship with God. And today we're going to see why faith in the gospel is so much better than trying to keep the law. So please turn in your Bibles, if you haven't already, to Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to dive right into the first five verses. I'm going to read right through it. Um, He says, you foolish Galatians. I mean, Paul doesn't pull any punches, right? In the beginning, in chapter 1, we learn, he said, what's the matter with you people? What's the matter with you people? What happened to you? Somebody fooled you. If you believe this message, you're going to be cursed. In fact, anybody who wants to propagate and multiply and share this wrong, false gospel, let them be cursed. Let them be anathema. Let him be a reject. He doesn't belong in the kingdom of God. He doesn't belong there. We've got to get the message right. <laughs> and then in chapter 3, straight, you fools. How would you feel if your pastor told you you were a fool? Ooh. Okay, I will not call you guys that. But because it's painful. It's offensive. But Paul was so passionate about it. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? <laughs> he doesn't even, he doesn't just call them fools. He says, somebody put a spell on you. You got duped. You got taken. Somebody fooled you. Who, who, who cast a spell on you that you didn't even recognize this? And he says, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Let's let's bottom line it right now. Did you receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Which one is it? Did you receive the Spirit by obeying the law or by believing what you heard? It's a rhetorical question because the answer is what? Believing what you heard. Hearing of faith. Hearing with faith. And here's what I want to highlight here. Verse 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Let's go back to that, but, but let's read the, the, the verses around it first. Okay, Let's read after it. Verse 4 said, Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Let's go back to verse 3. He says, you started with faith. The Spirit of God came to you not because you jumped through the hoops or you fulfilled certain requirements in the law. The Holy Spirit as a gift came to you and entered into your life and immersed His presence. You were immersed in His presence. You were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Not because of the law, but because you believe. Because you believe. That's what happened. See, what we need to understand is that faith is the operating system of the Spirit. Faith is the operating system. You could even say it this way. Faith is the operating system of the gospel. Because it activates the Spirit in your life. For example, I'm, this, this presentation that you're seeing on the screen up there that I'm seeing here on this monitor, this is, I, do, I do this and I did this on my computer. And the program is called Keynote. Now, some of you may never have heard of Keynote before, but you're more familiar with the program PowerPoint. Right? PowerPoint Okay, Keynote is an alternative to PowerPoint. And here's the difference. PowerPoint is meant to be used with Windows, like Microsoft Windows. I, Keynote doesn't run on Windows. It has a completely different operating system. Keynote I did on my Mac. I have a Mac Mini at home. I set it up to a big monitor and a mouse and a keyboard, wireless. So that, so that I can do all the things that I need to do on the computer. I didn't have to buy a big computer, just bought the 
little box, attach it to a monitor I already had, and there you go, good to go. But the operating system is Mac OS, not Windows. And so Keynote can run on Mac OS, but it cannot run on Windows. I can't run that as if it was a PowerPoint because there's a difference in the operating system. Same thing with, with, with your phones, for example. With your phones, you, you have, if you have an iPhone, like, like me, then you, you're running on iOS. If you don't have an iPhone, you're most likely running on Android. You have an Android phone versus this, Mac OS. And if that's you, could you, could you just raise your phone? If you, if you have a, not an iPhone, raise your phone. Raise your non-iPhone phone. Let me see. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. I pray, Lord, for a spirit of repentance in the name of Jesus. I don't get a commission from, from Apple, by the way. I just, I'm just a believer. <laughs> so each application has a specific operating system for it to work. Right? For phones, it's iOS or Android. For, for computers, it's Windows or Mac OS. And this is, this is what happens. We're shifting. You see, you need to understand that when we, when we become Christians, when we believe in the gospel, we're shifting operating systems. We were once operating on Windows, the law. But Jesus came and gave us Apple. Hallelujah. Actually, a, a case could be said, a case could be said that the first operating system was an Apple because Adam and Eve ate the apple. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. <laughs> so that's the first thing. Let's, we're going to build on this. Now, jump down to verse 13 and 14. I'm going to read some, some, some context. I'm going to read from verse 10. But our emphasis here is verse 13 and 14. For all who are of works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to do them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous one will live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. Did you, did you hear that? This is the scriptures telling us this. The law, the Mosaic law, the law that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai on the tablets, right? He went up to the mountain. He went up to the cloud, downloaded commandments onto a couple of tablets. See, there you go, from the cloud. He downloaded information from the cloud into his two tablets. Right? Tell you guys got to repent. He says, but here's Paul saying, the law, that law, and plus the 600 and 612 other, 603 other laws, the 613 commandments in the, old, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. They are not of faith. They are not of faith. And yet, you know, you, you, know, you know what I see? I don't know if you see this. I see a lot of Christians trying to take the law and make it of faith. They take the law, they'll quote the law to you and say, I'm believing the Lord for this because the, law, because the word of God says, they call it the word of God, but what it is it? What is it? It's the law. And they're trying to apply the wrong operating system on the wrong thing, on the wrong system. They're trying to mix the law with the gospel. So, and here's, here's one reason. Here's where the flaw comes in. Here's the flaw. The flaw is that you have to somehow convince God to give you those promises that are in the old covenant. And you do that by obeying. You do that by confessing. You do that by believing, by using faith. They believe that. They're taught that. Other, I've taught that in the past. That we have to somehow access the promises of God, convince God that we have enough faith for him to grant us those promises. But the new covenant says this, 
All the promises of God are yes in Jesus Christ. And if you're in Christ, you don't have to convince God to bless you. You're already blessed. I am blessed beyond a curse. For his promise will endure. And his joy will be my strength. We sang about that. It's amazing. It's just amazing how it, it, it explains to me now why so many believers walk around feeling defeated because they're using the wrong operating system. They still think they're in a performance-based relationship with God. Yes, it's a relationship, but oh, God, I got to do this, and I got to do this for you, and I got to do this, and I got to do this, and I got to do this. The work, Jesus said, this is how he defined the work that God requires is to believe, not to perform. He goes on, he says, in verse 11, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. Okay, I, I read that. But verse 12, however, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, the person who performs them will live by them. Verse 13, here's the two verses. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through what? Through faith. God's goal. Understand, look what he says here. He said in verse 14, in order that, that, that phrase, whenever you see that in the scriptures, when it says in order that, you have to find out why is it there? It's pointing to a purpose. Here's the reason why. When you ever see, you see those words, in order that, here's God's purpose, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles. How do we Gentiles possess the blessing of Abraham? Through Christ. How do we connect to Christ? Through faith. Not the law, through faith. And the result, two more words that you got to pay attention to, not just in order that, but also look for words that, like, so that. And he says it, so that. What would be the result of that happening? What is the result of Gentiles connecting to Abraham through faith so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith? Even through, Ab even through Abraham, the Holy Spirit was hidden. His blessing, his presence was meant to be in every believer, even in, in Abraham's time. But it was a mystery because Jesus wasn't revealed yet. Now that Jesus is revealed, now that we can have faith in Christ, and now that Jesus said, I need to go so I can send the Comforter to you, and now that the day of Pentecost had already come, now that the Holy Spirit has been poured out on all flesh, now we can receive the Spirit. But we do that, how? By, by faith. We receive the Spirit by faith. So, the first thing we need to understand in chapter 3 is that faith is the operating system of the Spirit. The second thing that we discover here is that faith is how we receive the Spirit. We receive Him by faith. You know, some people ask the question, do I have to speak in tongues to receive the Spirit? Speaking in tongues is not a condition to receive the Spirit. You don't have to speak in tongues when you receive the Spirit. You get to. It's a benefit after you receive the Spirit. And tongues is not the only one. Tongues is not even the most important gift. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 14. I wish, I, it, I speak more than tongues than all of you, but I wish that you guys would prophesy instead. I wish that you would encourage one another, strengthen one another, comfort one another. I wish that you would use your words rather than to babble before God in prayer, which is okay if you want to do that and if God has given you the gift. It's okay, but what's more important is if you speak to one another to strengthen each other, to comfort each other, to encourage one another, and to remind one another of the hope that is in you. 
That's more important. Do I have to speak in tongues? No, you don't have to, but you get to. It's not a condition. So what do I need to do to receive the Spirit? Nothing written in the law. Do I have to, do I have to apologize to my parents because I, I dishonored them? I broke that commandment? No. Good idea to do it, but no. Not a requirement. You can receive the Spirit before you do that. Jesus said, if you get angry at your brother, you're guilty of murder. I confess I'm a serial killer. Because I've been angry at my brothers many, many times. Do I have to settle accounts with them first before I can receive the Spirit? No. No. Because it's not what you do. It's not a performance thing. It's a faith thing. Is it a good idea to reconcile with your brothers? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it a requirement to receive the Spirit? No. Spirit's a gift. Salvation is a gift. Holy Spirit is a gift. All that's required is faith. Faith. So what we learn here, the second thing we learn is this, is that faith is how we receive the Spirit. Now, God's goal was to give His Spirit to all people. All people. This is what He wanted. He wanted all flesh to receive His Spirit. Men and women, young and old, slave or free, He wanted all people to receive His Spirit. This is the kind of relationship He wanted to have with us. He wanted to be able to put His presence inside us. That's how close he wanted to be. Now the law was not accessible to all people. The law, in fact, divided people. The law was what separated Jews from Gentiles. So the law could not be instrumental in getting all the flesh, all flesh on the earth to receive the Holy Spirit. It was too exclusive. And, and God wanted everyone to know him. So it couldn't be the law. Faith was the only operating system available to all people. Faith. The gospel is not, listen, if you're taking notes, this is what you're going to take. You need to take notes on this. Here's the thing. This one statement. The gospel is not law 2.0. The gospel is not an improvement on the Mosaic law. It's not a renovation of the ark or the tent of meeting. It's not that. It's a complete toss out and complete redo of our relationship with God. Now, what happened in the past leads to this so we can appreciate what happened in the past. We don't, we don't completely exclude it, but hey, once that's what, someone asked this question during the life group last week. They said, what about Matthew 5, 17, where Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. What about that? Doesn't that seem a little contrary to what you're, you're teaching and what Paul's teaching in Galatians? So what did he say? If you remember that, and if you want to turn to that, you can turn to that, Matthew 5, 17. He said, I'm telling you the truth. I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. So you see, Jesus is not trying to get rid of the law. He said he didn't come to abolish it. Why are you saying that we don't use it anymore? Why do you say it's not relevant to, to New Testament Christians anymore? Why? You know why? Let me ask you this question. Did Jesus or did not Jesus fulfill the law? Did he fulfill the law, yes or no? Did he fulfill the law, yes or no? He came to earth. The word became flesh. He came as a man born through the Virgin Mary, born under the law. Grew up in a culture that was based in the law of Moses, Jewish culture. Grew up with synagogues and temples and priests. And from an early age, he even challenged priests. He even 
took pilgrimages to the temple. He did this. Very, if you looked at him, he was a good Jew boy. He was a very good, devout Jewish boy. Probably had a bar mitzvah, honored his father and mother, followed his father in his footsteps in his trade, became a carpenter, right? Good Jewish, Jewish young man, growing up. What was his purpose? Why did he come? Why did the Son of God become the Son of Man? So that he could come, not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Okay, so now how does he fulfill the law? He fulfills the law by becoming the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He fulfills the law by fulfilling the picture that the first Passover gave of the Lamb's blood on the doorposts of the houses so that spirit of death could pass over the people who believed. And that's why his cousin John the Baptist said, look, he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus fulfilled all of the foreshadowing and the prophecies and the, the, the mysteries that were in the old covenant, Jesus fulfilled. He didn't come to abolish, he came to fulfill. Let me ask you something. Once it's fulfilled, how many of you have ever, how many of you have ever had a, um, one of those, uh, you ever get in the mail, those coupons from McDonald's or from a w Have you ever, ever gotten those things where, where you get like buy one, get one type of thing? And then, but underneath it says expiry date. And then it says uh, only good for one transaction at a time. Remember that? So how many of you, and how many of you use that? When, when you get it, you use it? Yeah, yeah, of course, we use it too. So now, if you were to take that coupon and you went there and you went to the drive-thru and I said, I got a coupon, okay, I'm going to get one Big Mac, but I get a second Big Mac for free. Okay, that's good. All right, two or two can dine, whatever, with this coupon. Okay, gotcha. That's your order. You get it. You get your order. Before you pay, you give the coupon. You show the coupon to the cashier. She takes your card, or you swipe your card, and you pay for it. You get that thing. Does she give you the coupon back? She doesn't give you the coupon back, right? Why? What if she gave you the coupon back? What might happen? You might come back, right, and, and do it again, right? You might get, and get the discount again. So what happened to that coupon? That coupon was fulfilled. You can't use that coupon again because it's finished. It's fulfilled. You can't, you don't go back to the law because Jesus fulfilled the law. He completed it. Everything that needed to be done by the law, he did it already so that you don't have to do it anymore. He's got your coupon. He's, he's the coupon. He's the one. So that you don't have to fulfill it anymore. So that you don't have to die the death that you should have died because you couldn't live the life that you were supposed to live. Are you following? Are you with me? God went to great lengths to make this happen, to make this redemption happen. Jesus redeemed us. That's what you're doing when you're giving the coupon at the drive-thru. You're redeeming a coupon. You're redeeming it. You're exchanging it. Best way to think of a redemption is an exchange. You're exchanging the coupon for the benefit of that coupon. And this is what Jesus did. It's the exchange life. Redemption is about exchange. Redemption is accessed by faith. Look what he exchanged. Listen to this. I love this. I, I can't take full credit. I saw this and heard this on TikTok. But it's excellent. It's excellent. Jesus died on a tree because the first sin was human beings taking something from a tree. On the cross, God was returning what was taken back to a tree, reversing the curse. Isn't that good? His hands were pierced because it was a man's hand that took the forbidden fruit from the tree in the Garden of Eden. His feet were pierced because the first messianic prophecy was about Feet. You remember this? How blessed are the feet of those who bring good news. His side was pierced. You remember that? The Roman soldier pierced him in the side 
went up to his heart. Out came blood and water. His heart was, his side was pierced with a sword because Eve was taken from Adam's rib and he was redeeming all of mankind, men and women. He wore a crown of thorns because the ground was cursed and reproduced thorns, God said, because of their disobedience. And what was God doing? He was redeeming the work of man. Jesus reversed the curse by replacing and restoring, exchanging what was taken from us at the beginning because of sin. Jesus died because the wages of sin is death, and he died the death we should have died so that we could live forever. He reversed the curse to free us from the law so that we can receive his spirit. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. That's the gospel. That's how beautiful the gospel is. Turns everything we lost around and says, take it back. I'm, I'm buying this back with my own blood and I'm giving it back to you. How do you get it? You don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to follow a bunch of regulations or do a bunch of rituals. You don't have to sacrifice a chicken or anything like that. Just believe. Have faith. Faith. Then in Galatians 3, 23 to 26. He says, well, why then did God give the law? If his original intention was to go by the Spirit, why didn't he do the Spirit first? Why did he do that right away, immediately? Well, here's what he says. But before faith came, we were kept in custody. Remember that word, in custody, under the law, being confined for the faith that was destined to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our guardian. Custody and guardian. Two, two key words in this passage. To lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, now it's come, we are no longer under a guardian. Why are we all no longer guardian? Because here's what's happened. For you are all sons and daughters of God through faith. In Jesus Christ. See, faith is how we join God's family. That's how we join God's family. And what we see, why was the law given? Why did we have to have these 613 rules and regulations and commandments? Why do we need that? Why did we have that? The law was meant to supervise. Remember the words custod custody and guardian. The law was meant to supervise us. Let me give you an example. Last week I shared this. I told you about how when I went to Bible school, our school added some commandments to the first 10. Commandment 11, 12, and 13. Thou shalt not drink, thou shalt not go to bars or to discos and dance. Thou shalt not watch movies. And remember I told you after my, during my first year break, I violated one of those commandments because I went to watch a movie with my girlfriend during summer break. And when I came back to Chicago for my next semester, the first thing we did was spiritual enrichment week and the speaker for the whole week just convicted everybody under sin. Everybody went to their counselor and said, I got sin to confess. Oh, And my sin, my grievous sin, was that I watched a movie with my girlfriend. We, yeah, I'll be honest with you. We didn't even make out. We didn't kiss. We didn't do anything in the, the, that was inappropriate in that, in that movie theater. We were, you know, she was a pastor's kid. I knew her from, from Presbyterian Church. Her, her dad was a friend of mine, right? In fact, a few years after that, after I graduated, he asked me to pastor his church because he was retiring. Like, wow. So... I felt so guilty. And remember I told you that when I went to confess my sin to my, my counselor, my advisor, they said, Mark, thank you for doing that. We really commend you for, you know, for being honest. But we're going to take this situation and we're going to put it in your file for the rest of your career here at Moody Bible Institute. It's going to be in your file. If it, you violate it again, you, you could jeopardize your status here and you could be expelled. But we're not going to do anything for now because you came and, but we're going to put it in there. That, you know what? For the next three years, I never forgot that that was in my file. So for the next three years, I didn't watch any movies, didn't go dancing anywhere, 
didn't have one drop of alcohol, didn't do anything like that, right? Because that sheet of paper was there and I didn't want to get booted out of Bible school. Right? It supervised me. But when I graduated, the heck with that file. You know, blockbuster, here I come. Stacks of VHS tapes. Watched three years worth of movies. Once I finished watching three years worth of movies and eat, eating pizza and beer, what did I do? I called my friends up and said, hey, let's go dancing. Because rules cannot transform you. They can curb you. They can guard you. They can protect you. They can supervise you. But they'll never change you. Never transform you. This is what the law was meant to do. It was meant to, until Jesus Christ showed up, it was meant, the law was meant to guard us, protect us from going crazy. It meant to supervise us until he came. It meant to push us towards him because we would be so frustrated. We could never obey the law. We could never do that. That's right. You'd never be able to do that. So you need to turn to God and say, God, help me. That's faith. God, even then, God was trying to use the law to nudge us towards faith. But the law is not of faith. It can nudge us towards it, but it's not of faith. And the only way that we can join God's family is through faith. When the spirit of adoption comes into us and we become one of his children, the law was no longer necessary when faith in Christ was available. So faith is the operating system of the Spirit. Second, faith is the way we receive the Spirit. And last, faith is how we join God's family. The faith is how we become sons and daughters. Of God. At the end of this Teaching, I, you know, in all the teaching, I always give one big idea. What's the big idea? Here it is. The big idea is that faith does for us what the law cannot do. There's just some things that the law is not able to do. The law will not make you righteous. The law, obeying the law will not make you closer to God. Obeying the law will not make you hear God's voice more clearly. Obeying the law is no guarantee that you will live a holy life. Obeying the law does not produce Christ-like character and godliness in your life. Don't be fooled. Faith does for us what the law cannot do. Now, we've been talking about this, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier We talk about how important the gospel is and we have to clarify what the gospel is. So let me clarify. I'm going to take the last few minutes to clarify the gospel in a way that fits what we've so far learned in Galatians chapters 1, 2, and 3, what it's about. And you'll be amazed. Remember, what's the, what, does anybody remember what the big, big idea is for the whole series? Remember? The bit, yeah, breaking, breaking Free is the big title, right? It's the title of the whole series. But remember the first two Sundays, I gave you the, the big, I always have a big idea for the entire series, and then each message has its own big idea. So the overarching theme of Galatians, of this series, Breaking Free, is that the gospel is the ABCs and the XYZ of the Christian life. Right? It's the beginning and the end. It's the alpha and the omega. It's the start, it's the start and the ending of it, right? And the finish of, of our faith. You will never outgrow the gospel. Because some people think, oh, the gospel, that's so simple, it's so elementary. It's element, it's elementary when you're starting, but it's deep and beautiful and powerful and transformative as you go along. You don't start with the gospel, then abandon it and follow the law. 
This is exactly what Paul was saying, talking about against. You don't start with the gospel, and then you start to follow rules and regulations and rituals and that kind of thing. No, no, no. It's the gospel from beginning, middle, and end. So I want to show you how that might work. And this presentation I'm going to, I'm going to share with you is a presentation of the gospel, but it is applicable not just to the unbeliever who wants to become a child of God, but it's also applicable to you and I as believers, depending where you locate yourself here. See if you can find yourself in this illustration. Bro, let's go to the next slide. It should be a blank, it should be like a white uh, slide, right? The next one. Um, yeah, there's the, there's the big idea, keep going. It's after, there we go. Okay, oh, I didn't expect that, okay, I thought I, thought I broke it. Are you using the revised file? Make sure you've clicked onto the revised one. Yes, thank you, that's the one. Okay. Here's the gospel. We live in a broken world, do you agree? You don't have to look very far until you find evidence of a broken world. You listen to the news, just walk outside, you know, see what's going on. Wasn't, in fact, it wasn't too far from here, right across the intersection where a cop was killed. There was another man who was shot in the back, or in the stomach, I should say, he was shot in the stomach, and then the, the perpetrator stole his car. That was the car that they shot him in when he was in Hamilton. Remember that, Remember that situation? The guy who was shot, not the cop, but the guy who was shot, it was a coworker of a friend of mine. And he would say, you know that guy that got shot? That's my friend. We work together. I said, what? Yeah. And who would have thought that in suburban Mississauga, some thug would walk into a Timmy's and shoot a cop and then steal a car and shoot the driver of that car? I've never heard of that ever happening in Mississauga, to be honest with you. At least not in this part of Mississauga. Doesn't have to be far to see that the world is broken. You see families broken up. You see gender dysphoria. People struggle, kids that are being forced, you know, to struggle with their gender identity. You have, you know, you have a nation that doesn't have any laws at all with regards to abortion at all. But they do have a law that permits older people to commit suicide, medically assisted suicide. Broken world, broken world. Okay. Now, God didn't intend for the world to be broken. In fact, his first intention was, and next slide, please, is was to create a world that was perfect and whole. Next slide, please. And so in this world, relationships thrive. In this world, there are, there's no tears, and there's no pain, there's no sickness, there's no disease. There's no divorce, there's no fatherlessness, there's no crime. God never created the world to have all the brokenness that it has now. The reason why the world is broken is because while we started off this way and God intended for it this way in the beginning, instead we decided to move away from that. Next slide, please. We decided to walk away from that, run, even run from God. And we ran, and we ended up creating a world that was broken because we're broken. By separating ourselves from God, we broke. Now, some of you are saying, yeah, man, I'm broke too. Not broke financially, but that too. Right? And it's like, yeah. And that's what the Bible calls it, right? What does the Bible call when you walk away from God? It's called sin. And what sin does is it creates a broken world. It comes under a curse, harder to work, right? Relationships are harder to make peace and to thrive. It's a struggle. Life becomes a struggle because everything's broken. Now, we don't like that because we're made in God's image. We don't like that. There's some part of us that really hates being in a broken world. And so we try our hardest to escape from that world, from the brokenness. We try things like, we try like pursuing success. We try pursuing like promotions. We try pursuing wealth. 
We try pursuing fame. We try, you know, and it doesn't matter what generation you're from. This is not just a, uh, you know, a, a baby boomer thing or a greatest generation thing or a millennial thing or a Gen Z thing. It's not that. Every human being knows there's something wrong with the world and is either trying to fix it or trying to get out of it, but they're trying to escape the brokenness one way or the other. Either they'll try to make a world that's no longer broken or they will escape from the world. Elon Musk wants to give us the option to actually get off the planet and go to Mars. The problem with that is human beings go to Mars, we'll break Mars too. Because sin will be on that rocket ship. Sinfulness will be there. Rebellion will be there. Self-centeredness, narcissism will be there. Anger will be there. Jealousy, and it'll all be there. And what happens is we try. We try religion. We try philosophies. You only live once. You know? We try all of these things. Some people try to escape using chemicals, drugs, alcohol, whatever. They try to escape because... Everybody wants to get away from, you know, get away from this broken place. But the problem with those methods, the problem with those kinds of tactics and strategy to escape from brokenness is that those are actually like bungee cords that snap us back into brokenness. Next slide, please. Just the next slide. We try to escape the world, but it snaps us back into brokenness. And we're stuck. We're stuck because we can't get out of our brokenness. Broken people getting out of brokenness, broken people trying to make a not broken world doesn't work. Doesn't work and we're frustrated. We're frustrated, we're divided, and we're in conflict with one another. But this is not God's intention for us. Next slide. God wants to take care of that sin problem so that we'll be fit for the world that he created. And what does he do? This is what he does. Next slide, please. Next slide. And the next one. He sends his son, Jesus Christ, down to earth. Next slide. Down to the earth. He lives the life we should have lived and dies the death we should have died. And on the third day, he rose again. Next slide, please. He is risen from the dead. Here's what happens. Because Jesus was innocent and because he was righteous and because he was the son of God, he redeemed us, just like I've, I described. He redeemed us on the cross. And because he was raised to life, because he is alive, he is alive. Hello, he's alive. We don't serve a good moral teacher who died 2,000 years ago. We serve a living God, a living Lord and a living Savior that we can walk and talk with every single day. He's alive. And because he's alive, because God raised him from the dead, God gave him the name above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and he made him king. Next slide, please. He made him king. And the gospel is this. That's the content of the gospel. That's what God did for us in the gospel. And he invites us to do this. Next slide. He invites us to turn and believe. Turn away from our brokenness. Turn away from our sin. Turn away from this broken world. Stop contributing to the brokenness of the world and turn toward God and believe what Jesus did for us at the cross. Believe. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you do that, here's what happens. This falls right in line with what we've been studying, Galatians 1, 2, and 3. Next slide. We become new people, new creations. We become God's sons and daughters. You can't see it from far away, but there's actually a yellow golden halo around both those men and women, those caricatures meant to be newness. We're not the old way. We've been transformed because the resurrection life 
that Jesus had lives in us. I have been crucified with Christ. I died on that cross with Jesus and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. This is what happened when I turn and believe. Christ lives in me. He puts his spirit in me. He puts his spiritual DNA in me and changes me from a slave and a sinner to a son of God. So that my life he has prepared to spend eternity with the new heaven, in the new heaven and the new earth that he's created. Three questions for you. When you look at that, what circle do you find yourself in? What circle do you think you're in living right now? Some of the good Christian men and women here will say, well, of course, I'm, I'm in that circle with the heart. I'm with God. Some very honest people will say, you know what? I just, you know, I surrendered my life to Christ just recently. Hasn't even been a couple of years yet. So I'm kind of, I, I've gone through that process. And I'm working on this part being new. But I look forward to the hope of being there with God. But some people will say this. So you might be here and you say, well, I'm actually, I think I'm, I think, hey, that's me hanging on the bungee cord. That's me, yeah, that's me. I've tried everything and I just keep bouncing back into brokenness. I tried everything and I can't get away from this addiction. I can't get away from this anger. I can't get away from this. It just keeps coming back. And I have to admit, I live in that broken world still part of that broken world. The surprising thing is some people might, who've been here already, who've been new creation, you've turned and you've believed, but somehow life has worn you down and you find yourself living in the broken circle. It's like, oh, it's no, I'm honestly, Pastor Mark, there's no difference with my life and the life of a non-believer. Same thing. But I used to believe. I thought I believed. You know what? I don't question your faith. I would even say you probably had an authentic relationship with Jesus. You got born again years ago. But somehow life has beat you up and you're back where you started from. Back where you started from. You know what the, you know what the solution is? The solution is the same for both unbeliever and believer. Second question, where do you want to be? Where would you like to live? Which circle would you like to live in? Which one? The first one, the one with the heart. The one with the heart. In the center of that, in the center of God's will, surrounded by his love, set free and given new life. Amen? I want to live there. I want to live there. How many of you want to live there? Is that, is that where you want to be? Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Third question. Is there anything stopping you right now from turning back to Jesus and embracing him again? He doesn't reject his kids, no matter how far they went. Remember the prodigal son? He went a long way off. The father was waiting for him every single day. And I'll tell you this, the father, if you're, if you're a child of God, who for some reason you find yourself in the broken world again and living in that circle, and you think, I don't know how I'm going to get back, the same path, the same way, through Jesus, through faith. And you're wondering, I don't think God will accept me. I want you to know this, that God is waiting for you on the horizon, just looking for your shadow along the horizon to see that you're coming back and he will come running to you. But you have to turn away from that brokenness and turn to him to go back to Jesus. 
just like an unbeliever would do that. It's the same. Why? Because the gospel is the ABC and the XYZ and the MNLOP. Oh, LMNOP. Got that wrong. And the GHIJK. The gospel is all of that. It's the same for all of us. So let's close the service. But I want to ask you this. What's keeping you? If you need to turn to Jesus again, if you need to come back, I love this recurring theme in the scriptures. No matter how dark a valley, how deep a valley, no matter how dark a hole, you find yourself, no matter how far away you find yourself, you can always come home. You can always come back. What's keeping you? Right now, maybe pride. Is it really worth it? I don't know if I can clean myself up. I don't know if I have enough strength to be able to... No, no, no. It's not about cleaning yourself up. It's like why would you do this? Do you ever, do you ever, before you take a shower, do you ever clean yourself up first? You ever do that? Oh, I better wipe all this up. Oh, my, I stink. Oh, let me wipe this down. Let me put some perfume on. Now I'm ready to take a shower. No, that, all that stuff happens after the shower. Shower comes first. Blood of Jesus comes first. Jesus comes first. Fixing your life, that comes later on but now you have him to be your partner to do that rather than walking away. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Turning and believing, both for someone who's never done it before, for the person who's doing it for the first time, turning and believing is the same for the person who is already a Christian and is kind of like a prodigal that needs to come back. Exact same thing. There's no magic wand. There's no magic formula. There's no magic prayer. There's no magic words. There's no sinner's prayer to pray. If there's anything, there's a confession. Jesus, be my Lord. I believe you're alive. I surrender. Simple as that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. I I think we need time to do this. Take a few minutes. If you need to come back to the Lord, if you need to turn and believe again and to renew your trust in him, or maybe you're here and... You've been growing up, around, growing up around this church stuff, but it finally made sense to you, and you realize, oh, I've been living on this bungee cord for too long a time. I need to turn finally and come to Jesus. doesn't matter if it's your first time or this is something that you needed to do for a long time as a believer. I'm going to ask you to come forward and come before God. I'm not going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to ask you to do business with God your way and just turn to him and just surrender to him and say, Jesus, be my Lord again. I believe. I believe. And guess what? He'll take you back just like that. He'll take you back. So what I'm going to do is this. Guys, I'll ask you to put soft music on. But that's all we're going to do because I'm going to count to three. I'm going to count to three. You know, if God has been speaking to you throughout this whole time together, you know you have to do business with God. You know you have to return to him. Then after the count of three, just come. Just come. And if you want, you can kneel up here before him. You can bow down or you can just stand in his presence, bow your head, and just be in his presence and return. 
the act of moving for walking forward is kind of prophetic. It's a prophetic act of you actually walking back to the Lord. That's what it is. Okay? It's not you walking towards me or to me at all. It's you walking to the Lord. So, Father, right now I ask, Holy Spirit, that you turn up the knobs. Lord, bring it up to volume 11, Lord. Your voice speaking to our hearts. I do believe that you have been speaking to people's hearts today. And Lord, for those who need to come to you for the first time, I pray that they would have the courage to come forward and give their life to you. For those of us who've strayed, we've come a long way, we need to come back. Let this be that opportunity as well, Lord. You love us so much. Thank you for receiving us. We just want to come to you honestly and sincerely. One, two, three. Oh.